Welcome to MUFON Los Angeles. Our speaker tonight, Freddie Silva, is a well-known crop circle researcher from England who has been working in this field for quite some time now. Um, without getting deeply into background, I think that Freddie's uh, knowledge and research stands on its own. So help me welcome Freddie Silva. Thank you, Don. Well, you realize you're a six foot five. <laughs> Does this look good? Keep working on it. I wasn't talking about me. <laughs> anyway, thank you very much for being here. I know how difficult um, these kind of subjects usually are to be involved with, uh, given the amount of media uh, publicity that's given to uh, subjects like crop circles, and most of it these days is not exactly positive. Uh, if any of you have seen the Discovery Channel and Learning Channel episodes on crop circles, you'll know exactly what I'm saying. Uh, we've all seen the uh, pictures of people making crop circles in New Zealand, uh, primarily because none of, none of the researchers actually live in New Zealand. And um, we see time-lapse photography of people making this fantastic design in under five hours. And of course, what they don't tell you is the fact that uh, they spend three days actually surveying the entire field and laying down stakes with string. This is why when you actually see this, these people making crop circles uh, without measurements or anything, uh, it seems so effortless. Of course, you don't actually see this. You don't actually see this uh, on TV, uh, but you can actually read about it on my website. Um, is that thing on, Don? Great. Right. Well, without too much further ado, because I've got a lot of ground to cover, and uh, I'm not going to talk about myself at any uh, point, because I'm not actually part of uh, the phenomenon. Um, what's important here is to actually we get some information across. Uh, I once very, very briefly covered the uh, phenomenon as it's happened over the 2000 season. Uh, we've had the most extraordinary year uh, in terms of patterns. Uh, every year is extraordinary. Uh, this year we seem to be uh, saying it's more extraordinary than ever because the patterns are so complex. In fact, some of them are taking up to three weeks to reproduce on computer alone. Um, so I'm just going to cover a few here very briefly, uh, at least on the information that I've found on these so far. Uh, this wonderful uh, five-petal lotus flower uh, happened under a, a hill called Golden Bowl Hill. Uh, which uh, has a bit of a folklore behind it because uh, a lot of golden bowls seem to be seen flying in and out of this uh, hill uh, since time immemorial and we're talking about a couple of thousand years. Uh, in fact, local people in this area uh, are so fed up with watching bowls of light around Golden Bowl Hill that they don't even pay attention to them anymore. Uh, but uh, one day this little uh, beautiful thing popped up and uh, we've got uh, basically five-fold, six-fold geometry uh, and, and an encoded sevenfold geometry. What we're dealing here is a ratio of five, six, seven. And um, the ratio of six, five, if anybody's ever read the book, two thirds, and uh, believe me, it's quite a large book to go into. It deals with a, uh, a universal harmonic. Uh, a, a six over five is the Earth's retrograde precession um, divided by the equatorial miles of, of uh, well, of the equator. It, it's actually a universal harmonic. Uh, so there's some interesting science that uh, should be coming out of this formation in the next few months if we just pay attention to it. Um, the other interesting thing that happened here was that we re registered some of the highest frequencies ever registered in a crop circle. We're talking about 1.5 gigahertz. Um, I'll come back to this later in the, uh, in the lecture. But the net effect of this was that uh, it rendered my camera equipment obsolete. And I don't know why I'm laughing because it's cost me a fortune. Um, all the camera equipment got fried, and uh, that's exactly the words that were used by my laboratory technician. Uh, the circuit board went completely dead, it just fried it. Uh, my partner, who also works with um, radio frequencies and uh, background frequencies and crop circles, found that all uh, LE LCD displays, liquid crystal displays inside this crop circle, uh, when you turn 90 degrees to the energy lines, the, these LCDs went black. Um, so obviously the energy in these crop circles this one in particular, and especially the ones of this year, um, have a certain effect. They've reached a certain frequency that it's actually affecting equipment to a very, very high degree. Here's two that happened on the same night next to each other. Uh, the one on the right is a beautiful octagon pattern. Um, it's the octagon in esoteric philosophy is a completion of a cycle. In fact, uh, it's when you have an expanding octagon as you have here. 
it's actually the, uh, the breath of Allah. It's very poetic. And uh, basically you're dealing with the breath of life, the expansion and the contraction rhythm of the universe. Uh, and when you reach an eightfold pattern, you basically completed a cycle. You completed an octave. Uh, it's a kind of musical theme that runs through these, uh, these formations. Um, and also on the, uh, on the left, you have something called... Uh, What's his name? Hawkins. That's right, my good friend uh, Gerald Hawkins. He's uh, come up with some interesting th theorems over the years in crop circles. They're based on Euclid uh, and his geometry. And the uh, five theorems that Gerald has extracted from crop circles are uh, actually not found in any of the books that Euclid wrote, uh, which is kind of interesting because he's actually extracted them all from crop <laughs> circles. Now in this formation where you have a, uh, an area which is a circle bounded by a triangle, you have Hawkins' uh, second theorem which basically gives you a double octave. So we're already starting on a music theme here, which makes him a very happy boy, actually. <laughs> the main patterns of this year were patterns that give us an impression that uh, we've been communicated with uh, in terms of fourth dimension. Um, this is one of three patterns that were laid down which had a certain um, visual analogy to, to them. When you view them from the air, especially when the light hits the crop, what you get is this illusion uh, where two uh, cubes seem to pop up at you and two cubes seem to go into the ground. It's a visual illusion and um, some of them have actually showed curves where actually no curves exist. It's almost like you've seen a ball going through a net and uh, I've actually found some reference to all this in Einstein's theory of relativity where the uh, actual um, dimension of space is curved, not linear. So we've been given some very, very extensive information about the makeup of the universe, and particularly this year. Uh, here we have uh, a pattern consisting of 1,600 elements, and uh, all contained within straight lines from above. The problem is when you actually look at this pattern on the ground, there isn't actually a straight line inside because the crop has been laid like waves. Now you try doing that on the ground with any degree of accuracy to try and lay the crop in wave patterns so that you end up with straight lines. That's quite, uh, quite an accomplishment. There was also some other information that came um, through, and it was actually from a, a channel of all, all places. Um, it was to do with an Arthurian legend about a table that was made containing 1,600 elements, and it was a table that, which was round. Uh, and I'm just putting this information out in case anybody else has any uh, stimulating ideas on that subject, because it's just something that's very, very new. How big was that? It was about 350 feet across. Don't ask me what it is in meters because it's too confusing. <laughs> We've all gone to metric in Europe and it's a pain in the ass. Um, as a little um, aside, uh, this formation appeared next to this uh, about three weeks later. Um, it was very interesting because I do a lot of dowsing in crop circles and uh, in this particular design I actually doused nothing. I mean it was dead. Uh, the other one was generating concentric rings of energy which I'll come on to later. Uh, it showed all the classic dowsing patterns of electromagnetic energy but on this heart shaped one nothing seemed to be popping up. And um, I took a look at the, uh, the ground evidence. There was a lot of uh, construction lines hidden underneath the crop which is usually not a good sign of authenticity. A lot of broken stuff. And you can also see from some of the, um, the circles around the perimeter that they've been sort of made to fit as if someone's actually run out of space and had to squeeze the last one in. Um, I actually started dowsing for the maker of, uh, of, or the origin, should I say, of this particular design. And uh, my equipment was giving me the feedback that it was actually man-made. So on a hunch, I thought, well, let's see if I can run through some known names of perpetrators. And um, sure enough, one stuck. And I kept this to myself for about a week. Um, got a, a phone call from a friend of mine who lives in Avery. She uh, makes a lot of contact with the local farmers. And uh, she called me up and said, um, I found out that the, uh, for the heart shape formation was actually man-made. Uh, the farmer gave permission to this guy. And um, it was done for a wedding. And uh, you'll never believe who, uh, who made it. And I said, uh, go on, try me. And she says, Rob Irving. And I said, that's exactly the name I got from my dowsing equipment which is quite extraordinary in a way that you can actually now begin to see a way in which the subconscious works with this phenomenon, uh, if only you let it. So it's a, there's a lesson there even in the man-made ones, uh, that we actually should be trusting our own skills as such, and it's one part of the phenomenon which actually deserves a lot more attention than is given.
Hardly needs words, really. <laughs> it's quite extraordinary. Um, there actually isn't a single curve in this design. It's a visual illusion. Um, some of you will see this as the magnetic field of the Earth uh, with the two positive and negative dipoles. Uh, in fact, those two little circular areas where those people are standing uh, actually does positive and negative, just as they do uh, on planet Earth. Um, you can also see it as the uh, biodynamic field around a human being. Uh, if you can imagine that in 3D with the lights popping up at you. Um, the other thing is that it can also be the chromosome splitting. All of these are perfectly correct. Uh, and it also shows the multidimensional nature of the phenomenon. Because each formation, uh, as we're finding out the information, seems to have five, six, seven, eight, even ten different layers of information built into the same symbol. And they're all totally correct, depending on your point of view and your idea of learning. It can also be the uh, two hemispheres of the human head. Uh, left brain, right brain. And it's uh, interesting in the fact that uh, a few days before this thing appeared, um, Colin Andrews, uh, my partner, um, possibly the world's um, greatest authority on crop circles, along with Pat Delgado, his partner, um, he had this idea that he should be trying to tell people that uh, he's found magnetic anomalies in some of the crop circles. In fact, in 20% of them, uh, he's finding magnetic anomalies that he cannot account for by people. In 5% of them, the ones he's an actually analyzed, um, the actual magnetic grid of the Earth has been twisted 3 to 5 degrees. We've had a lot of compass uh, deviations over the years, by the way, uh, when it comes to this. So all he's doing is basically adding to the bulk of evidence that we already know about. So a few days after he makes his announcement, this enormous thing pops up. So there's that synchronicity again. Someone here is basically trying to tell you something. There was a, a story that came up in the Daily Paper, in one of the Daily Papers in the Daily Mail, that had to show the full, I think it was a double-page spread by one of the uh, team calling themselves the Circle Makers, uh, otherwise known as Team Satan. And this is for real, believe me. Um, these three people claim that they've made all the crop circles since time immemorial. Uh, and since some of these formations go back to 1690, I think if they've made all these, we should be studying them, not these. Because they've mastered the idea of time travel. Um, one thing this, this little, one of the, the members of this team seems to have forgotten was the fact that uh, this thing actually, again, is not created strictly with straight lines because these little triangles and diamond shapes that you see in this formation are actually created again by the crop going in a straight line, deviating in a curve so that it actually forms the edges of each triangle. Now, why would anyone go to such trouble to create such a thing? Why not just plank something in a straight line and be done with it? So again, it's uh, as if the circle makers, the real circle makers, are showing us every time that we up the stakes on the ground with all of this information, they up the stakes with the way these are constructed. This is actually the geometric diagram of how that particular pattern was made. And you can start seeing the three-dimensional quality of it, almost as if you're seeing planet Earth with its complete magnetic structure. This is the actual way it was made. <coughs> That took me a good part of a day. I'm glad I quit my day job. <laughs> we also have esoteric symbols. Uh, here we have one which relates to the throat chakra. Uh, very, very beautiful formation. I, I walked into this first uh, morning, it actually appeared, and actually you could still see the dew drops on top of the actual plants, which means that no one could have possibly walked over them. Um, quite exceptional. I had a meditation in here with some people who do uh, sound healing. And um, we, everybody unanimously saw uh, a sort of a blue light. Everybody kept uh, feeling their throat. And it's interesting that later we discovered this had something to do with the throat chakra, this design. Um, but the interesting thing is that the throat chakra is usually associated with the color blue. Again, there's that subconscious connection that you're actually feeling it, you're experiencing it in here, and it's shown to you on a physical level. And of course, uh, possibly the most complex formation ever, and of course, by this time next year, we'll be saying this about something else, so I wouldn't worry about it. Um, a sunflower, a pine cone, whatever you want to, uh, to see it, um, constructed not using circles, but using uh, the golden mean ratio, which is the ratio of the sp natural spiral found behind all living organisms on Earth, uh, which is basically phi, if you know your mathematics. Um, and this particular formation is a representation of one of the most important mantras in Hinduism, the Bija Mantra. 
Uh, it's one of the seeds of sound which influenced the chakra system of the human body, which allowed the entry of energy into, into your body, basically. Um, this is actually the, uh, the one that stimulates the crown chakra, uh, the most highest chakra of all, which allows uh, brainwave patterns to be altered so that you have a connection to the subconscious levels. And it's kind of interesting that I've received an uh, incredible number of reports of people going into this formation actually achieving or experiencing higher levels of awareness. And again, this information wasn't actually released uh, until these people were actually, the information actually came in, so there's no cheating going on, if you like. But an absolutely beautiful pattern, nevertheless. Where was this at? Uh, this was in between Pickett Hill and Woodborough Hill in the Pusey Vale, where we seem to get a lot of action. And England? Oh, yes. These are pretty much uh, spread throughout England, uh, although the whole phenomenon itself is worldwide. Pretty much so, yeah. I can only cover so much. <laughs> oh, that's a different lecture altogether. I'll let someone else handle that one. Uh, sir, uh, it's rather interesting. Somebody described that as 22 spirals going clockwise and then 22 spirals going counterclockwise. Correct. Isn't that amazing? It is amazing. It took me three days to draw. And then you have all these concentric circles which have to be basically put outwards as well. Uh, it's quite a feat, actually, quite an incredible feat. And the other th interesting thing about it is that if you want to draw fire, you basically have to bisect a, bisect a, a certain strategic, a strategic angle uh, in a uh, circle, which also includes having to draw a square. In fact, you, if you want to see the geometry of just how to construct one spiral of this, uh, it's on my website, and there'll be a website address at the end of the lecture, because uh, it really is quite extraordinary how you go about doing this. Which brings me to the actual lecture itself. <laughs> And if I can try and squeeze this into a couple of hours so we can go to uh, paradise, is it? Yes. Brilliant. I like it. L.A., what a place. Um, <laughs> I've got a lot of jet lag, so I'm probably going to have a very wicked sense of humor. Um, I also can't see what I'm saying either. Anyway, uh, the primary uh, reason why I wanted to come here and, and talk uh, is because of mostly because in England they don't want to talk about us anymore. The debunking has become so extraordinary that no one pays attention to crop circles anymore and the farmers have had it up to here with the phenomenon because no one is telling them what's causing it, uh, who's causing it, and furthermore, who can we blame so we can put them in jail so that we can get some money out of them. So the farmers are having a very, very rough time of it uh, and not least helped by people in the media who are saying the whole thing is done by a bunch of people. Uh, who are basically bored to go into the pub, they get some ropes out and some measuring tapes and some uh, planks of wood and they go out and stake these incredible designs. So they're, f they're, they're fed up and people likewise are pretty much fed up with it. So that's why I'm very glad you're all here. Um, <laughs> anyway, um, talking about sound, sound is, a, is a, um, a founding principle in the creation of universal matter. Uh, in fact, if, uh, it's the one thing that every religion actually agrees on. Uh, in fact, if you look at the Bible, you look at the words of St. John, in the beginning there was the Word, and the Word was with God. It's written right there. And Word, of course, is a form of vibration, and vibration is a form of movement, it's a form of sound. Uh, sound is actually very, very important. Uh, so important, in fact, that some of our, most of our, our earliest cosmologies, going back to the Ethiopians, relate to sound. In fact, they talk about the first humans singing in order to communicate, and it's only when we forgot the tune that we actually adopted words to try and communicate with one another. We also know about the stories of Jericho, how um, legions of uh, seven men with seven trumpets walked around the wall seven times, uh, just like in the notes of the diatonic music scale, and they brought the walls of Jericho down. Likewise, you have Ella Fitzgerald, and if you leave Ella Fitzgerald in a room singing a high E, and you have lots of lead crystal, it's not going to be a good idea. Similarly, we have people like George Kellogg here in America, in uh, New York in 1932, when he went to a fireman's convention and uh, he had this massive flame shooting out of the ground and he was able to quench this flame using sound frequency. Um, so you can use sound in a very, very creative manner, either destructively or positively. Today we can actually use sound to heal bone fractures, uh, cure all kinds of diseases. And, um, all to do with sound frequency, because your body essentially is, is made up of the same frequencies. It's also a conductor of consciousness. Uh, and in fact, if you again look at uh, some of the... Thank you very much. Okay, there's a little pointer here. Maybe a pointer to oh, technology. Now it's getting very confusing. Thank you. 
can't afford these things in England, you know. If anybody has any gas, by the way, I'll take it as payment. <laughs> I'll take it, you've been to England as well. Um, <laughs> yes, um, Jesus actually describes uh, his origins very interestingly. Uh, he actually mentions this in the Bible, uh, and I quote, When my father thought to send me into the world, he sent his angel before me, by name Mary, to receive me. And when I came down, I entered in by the ear. There's an interesting concept. So sound, as we express it, is a very, very formative principle. It's, um, it comes in, in a very interesting shape. It comes in the form of a spiral, uh, because sound is resonance. Uh, resonance is movement, and the natural movement is expressed in the spiral. In fact, if you look at Latin, uh, the word spiracula is actually translated etymologically as um, the octave. Well, that's Latin word for resonance. So you have a connection between sounds and a spiral, right going back a long, long time. The spiral itself is also a very primitive form of nature. In fact, there's nothing much you can do without the spiral. Uh, you can't have the golden mean. You certainly can't have fire, like you just had in that crop circle. And you'll find it uh, macrocosmically expressed in the galaxy or microcosmically expressed in an ammonite. You can find it uh, in the hermetic maxim as above, so below. And in fact, the spiral is so important that it actually creates the movement of the blood within your veins. And if it wasn't for this spiral, none of us would be living and breathing right now. The importance of the, uh, the spiral can be found etched on uh, stone chambers throughout the world, where if you go into some of these chambers and chant, you will actually create spirals in smoke. And experiments have been done uh, in chambers such as Newgrange, like, a, like it's shown here, where you fill the chambers up with smoke and you throw in sound frequency at the uh, smoke and you'll actually get spirals, just like the ones that are etched on its walls. So there's a reason why these, uh, not only why the spirals were etched onto the, the uh, actual uh, walls of these places, but they did something. Um, and that something is because these sites were actually used to alter brainwave patterns. The first spiral. It's almost in focus as well. <laughs> now, when you change brainwave patterns, you're also starting to affect uh, consciousness because basically your brain is a set of brainwave patterns, just like your whole atomic structure of your body is a brainwave pattern. Now, having said all this, the spiral in its other important facet is the foundation of every crop circle ever. Not just in the smallest formations, um, in the tiny little circles, but also in where you have straight lines and pictograms. Uh, whenever you get anything that remotely resembles a straight line, you'll find that at the beginning of these, there will be a spiral at some point. So it's a formative principle of the phenomenon, regardless of its size. And I guarantee you, every single circle in this thing was a spiral. Now, some of you will see this as the uh, um, uh, mammalian, mammalian, yes, uh, eight hours of jet lag, uh, skeleton. Um, you'll also find the bass clef of the music scale here. There's all kinds of meanings behind this formation, but at the basis of it, it's always, always a spiral. This particular one being about, ooh, just roughly bigger than Stonehenge itself out in the distance. In fact, if anybody actually knows the story of this particular formation, it was uh, found within four, a 15 minute window by two pilots. Um, and one of them was actually ferrying a doctor, so there was two eyewitnesses. There was people on the ground who had never seen this before, the guards of Stonehenge, uh, during their course of doing their rounds to check to see if anybody's jumped over the fence and hasn't paid their ticket. Uh, they go around every 15 minutes, and one minute it, was, it wasn't there, next minute, yes it was. So whoever had to do this not only mastered the technique of visibility, they also had to levitate above the wheat because every stalk in this was bent an inch above ground level. Absolutely. Makes it even more difficult, doesn't it? <laughs> oh, now you're stretching my imagination. Um, I think it was 5.15 in the afternoon. Ah, we don't know. We don't know. But no one saw anything. Now this, um, oh dear, it's a bit out of focus, sorry about that. Um, when you actually take the spiral as a, as a vortex in 3D, you have something called the tube torus, which anyone who's familiar with Kabbalah will know very well. Um, this tube torus is a very, very important shape because it's a primary shape in the generation of matter. 
and it's something that physics is coming to terms with very, very rapidly in the last uh, few decades. Also, more importantly, because it underlies the molecular structure of life. Like I was saying, you can't have anything without spin. And uh, when you have a spiral in 3D, it gives you the spin, which gives you the idea how molecules vibrate around the nucleus. You also find this as a representation in a crop circle in 2D. That's, that's quite a small one. In fact, if you try to walk, uh, the um, tube torus, as I know esoterically, you have to actually reverberate anti-clockwise. You can't, you can't have a tube torus which is clockwise for some reason. I don't know. It's just an esoteric uh, maxim. Um, I actually tried to walk this uh, clockwise, including a whole bunch of people. We all got very, very sick. Um, <laughs> it's almost like you're ruffling a cat's fur the wrong way, you know? Uh, and then when you try to walk it the other way, you actually have this heightened sense of awareness and this sharpness of vision. It's quite extraordinary. And we only found out the information after doing this, uh, which kind of is a bit of a lesson. You should really brush up on these things before you walk in. They're very, they've got a very naughty sense of humor, actually. How, how soon were you able to get there? I actually went in there about a week afterwards. Uh, and so when you still have that effect a week later, it's saying something. Um, there's all kinds of stories that comes with this formation as well. And if I go into them, I'll never finish this lecture. But uh, there was a still point of energy uh, about 30 feet away from the center of the formation. And in fact, every genuine crop circle, by the way, the spiral never starts at the center, never, never starts at the center. It's always off to the side, and eventually it achieves a circular motion, which is actually slightly elliptical, which presents some serious problems for hoaxes. Anyway, not to diverge too much, at this particular point uh, of energy, we tried uh, doing experiments with pendulums, and every one of them, within three seconds, became still, as if they'd been dragged down to the ground like a piece of concrete. I mean, usually, uh, It'll do this, and eventually it'll do this. But the, I'm talking about quite astonishing. And again, esoterically, that is something that does happen. It's supposed to have a still point of energy at its source because it is the flux of energy. It keeps moving in and out of itself like a donut. Now, having said all this about atoms and things, the uh, largest expression of all this spiral energy is seen in the planets themselves. And in fact, in the olden days, the planets were seen as gods. And it's reflected in their Greek word, akousmata, or the resonant ones, acoustics. Again, we're talking about sound here, uh, the formative principle of life behind atoms, behind spirals, behind planets themselves. Now, these planets that go around our solar system have harmonic ratios in their orbits. Uh, this was discovered by Kepler a long, long time ago. Um, these are, of course, mean orbits because, of course, they're elliptical in orbit. And when you get these expressions and relationships of planets to one to another, you get something called geometry, or to put it in much more concise terms, sacred geometry. That's why it was called that, because there was a relationship in their sacredness. They were the epitome of the foundation principles of life. Eventually, I will talk about crop circles. <laughs> now, this energy, uh, which is electromagnetic in nature, um, it's expressed so below at the strangest of places. Uh, it actually generates itself as geodetic energy. Some people call it ley lines at sacred sites. Some of these would be stone obelisks. Some of them would be stone circles. Some of them will be uh, long barrows or tumuli. Uh, some people might call them cairns or dolmens, any expression you care to mention. Where you have these sacred sites, you have an interconnecting, two interconnecting lines of energy or a node point. And at these node points, very interesting things start happening energy-wise. There are relationships that seem to be happening. At the center of these diagrams, those little dots is actually the many you just saw in that picture. Those outward radiating rings have been doused. They're actually they're like ripples in a the pond. They're energy patterns which are rippling outwards. And as you can see, each one of those rings has a strategic location to it. This, this has all been um, mapped on the ground, transferred to the computer. And these relationships, as you can see, are explicit in sacred geometry your pentagram or your hexagram, and it's all in terms of relationships. So whatever you have up in the planets, in terms of the orbits, you're also finding it on the ground. It's very, very much organized energy. 
But these aren't the only places where you'll actually um, find this energy. In fact, uh, the Catholic Church, a long, long time ago, found out that it was good to go into these stone circles. And uh, sometimes, uh, with extraordinary little subtlety, they planted their sites on top of these ancient sites. <laughs> this particular one is actually uh, not far from where my grandparents were born in Portugal. Um, amazing what a little concrete can do. Uh, but they have uh, sarsen stones about the height of Stonehenge itself. This is a very, very tall uh, dolmen in very, very good shape to which they added a nice little uh, crypt inside with a um, Virgin Mary as an altar. And you can still see the, uh, the rocks all tied together nicely on the inside, just like a real dolmen. But it's been Christianized. The point was that um, in the early days of, uh, of when the Celts were being phased out by the Christians throughout Europe, the church realized that there was a certain energy at these sites, the crossing points of electromagnetic energy, where the pagans, or, uh, which basically means a country dweller for no other reason, the pagans used to go worship at these sites to get healed. Now, this could take the form of physical healing, or it could take the form of spiritual healing. Why? They didn't know why. It was just a fact to do that with the fact that there was energy present at these sites. So what they started doing uh, with the church was superimposing all their sites but not only that, but they used to design these structures to conceal the very dowsing pattern. So places like Chartres uh, Cathedral, uh, one of the greatest hymns to sacred geometry, is not only built on the principles of sacred geometry, but it hides the very pattern of energy that it's built upon. So they knew what they were doing because they wanted basically to control this information. It's, of course, this was all very familiar and it's all happening today again. Here we have one particular uh, pattern, which is uh, Salisbury Cathedral in England. Um, another, again, another high point of Gothic cathedral building. Um, you, you can find concentric rings here. You can find two lines of crossing energy, uh, where you give you the, it gives you the node point. That's why you have these naves. That's why you have these places called altars, because they're there to alter something. And when you go into a church, you go through the entrance. Etymology is a wonderful thing. You can pick any of this stuff up in any dictionary. And it's amazing how our language has changed. But it's all there, the altar. You go to these places because they alter, it alters your brainwave patterns. And the place where the priest usually stands is usually the place where the crossing points of energy actually are. And you'll find where the priest usually stands, particularly in Europe actually, um, where the priest usually stands, you'll have a piece of red granite. Now, red granite was a fundamental piece of equipment in things like the Egyptian pyramids, which, of course, were also used for heightening states of awareness. So they knew what they were doing. They were playing about with certain types of energy. What we've found out over the years, and I'm just talking about myself, and this is, by the way, this is research not just that I've come up with, but a whole bunch of other people have come up with as well. So it's not proprietary. It's, it's everybody's. So you can rip me off. <laughs> you have my permission. But the, the thing that the churches knew about, and certainly the pagans knew about, was that when you combine sacred geometry, electromagnetic frequencies, sound frequencies, you have this effect on brainwave patterns. You have a change of consciousness. When you talk about things like Gregorian chant, when you associate it with, Goth with the Gothic period, Gregorian chant has certain frequencies which alter the brainwave pattern. And in fact, there are stories of monks in Europe who, once the, uh, the, the new popes decided to take away Gregorian chant, their lives completely fell apart. They used to rely on Gregorian chart and its frequencies to conduct their daily affairs, to conduct their way of thinking, to conduct their, the healthy movement of their body. Once you took that away, they became listless. They just began to literally wither away, and no one could figure out why. Now, uh, Alfred Tomatis did a lot of experiments on this and found that uh, the simple reason was that these frequencies were helping the monks to basically energize themselves. So he wrote a letter to the Pope and said, put back Gregorian chant, you'll find that they'll be perfectly fine. They don't need psychiatrists, they don't need pills. And sure enough, within a year of uh, re-establishing Gregorian chant, the monks were fine. There's nothing, nothing wrong with them. So there's something about these frequencies that do something to people. And uh, further experiments actually show that when um, you take equipment into Gothic cathedrals and you play sacred music, um, you actually change brainwave patterns by up to 4,000%. So when you stand in a church, you're grounding your body, you are an antenna to God, whatever you want to call it, to higher levels of perception. They are there literally to help you uh, reach a, a certain level of awareness. Now, 
there has been a historical connection between crop circles and sacred sites. Uh, this is uh, originally found out by Delgado and Andrews uh, back in the early 80s when circles were still circles, circles with rings, very simple things, but there was always a connection. There was always standing near sacred sites, near tumuli, uh, which actually no one's actually buried in them, funnily enough. Um, they were standing next to Stonehenge or um, very, very old sites now occupied by churches. There was a connection there. And we also have reported uh, uh, connections of changes of brainwave patterns, which uh, my colleague Lucy Pringle has been studying for years. People are reporting changes of awareness in crop circles, heightened states of consciousness. This is all becoming very familiar now. It's almost like you're entering a new type of temple. You also have raised right brain activity, and this is something that Lucy has measured on certain occasions, uh, where your frequencies of your right brain are actually altered. And uh, I am not the only person to say this, and I say this with embarrassed sincerity, uh, that whenever I go into a formation and start doing any measuring of any kind, uh, I can add up to five, and after that it gets very, very difficult. Your left brain ceases to function. It's like it's shifting you. Whatever's in these things is shifting you towards the right brain, to the intuitive side. The other thing we seem to have been finding over the years, there are a lot of healings reported in crop circles. People suffering from Parkinson's disease suddenly find that they are fine within 24 hours, even though they've suffered from uh, Parkinson's for 24 years. Alzheimer's, people who are allergic to oilseed rape, which you call canola here in America, that lovely yellow plant, they'll nevertheless walk into a crop circle made in canola and they don't suffer, suffer any ill effects. The weirdest things are happening. Now, how do crop circles um, share the same characteristics as cathedrals and sacred sites of stone? Well, as I said before, these sacred sites are all aligned within node points of energy. Here we have an example of a lovely formation from last year at Windmill Hill, and you can see part of the Windmill Hill sacred complex at the top of the picture. And you can see at the bottom with the red lines, this is, this is my dowsing diagram, just a straight line dowsing diagram. Again, some people call it lay lines, which is actually not quite correct because lays are geometric alignments, which are usually straight. Um, geodetic lines are much more correct because we're dealing with the nerve energy. Excuse me. Um, and you'll see that uh, the site the, of the actual crop circle is directly related, not only in energy, but in frequency and polarity to the site near it. This particular formation, the energy pattern, came from Silbury Hill itself. That's uh, Europe's largest man-made pyramid. And uh, the crossing pattern that goes from left to right predicts the size of the next crop circle, if you can believe that. It's quite an astonishing thing when you can actually go out there with a pair of coat hangers and do this. Which is, again, it's not really... It's not, a, I'm not trying to show off, it's just the fact that they're trying to tell you that you can actually do this quite easily for yourself. Anybody has this ability. I mean, I used to be in advertising, and here I am talking about this. And I used to be an atheist, and now I believe in God. So, and I think that's part of the message that we've been given here, is the fact that we need to be more intuitive about this phenomenon, not just measure it. But since we're dealing with measure, here we have a lovely formation, um, which was actually channeled about a week before its appearance in, uh, in Beckhampton. Very interesting pattern. Uh, a lot of people actually went in here for about five minutes, were so heat dehydrated they lost about, uh, oh, let's see, the equivalent of six pints of water in about an hour. Uh, I was one of them. Um, very, very strange effects indeed. But the other interesting thing about this particular formation was this dowsing pattern. Here, um, the orange um, pictogram in the center is the physical pattern. And you'll notice that around it are four rings of energy. Those are actually doused on the ground and then measured and then uh, put on a computer and you'll see that when you project the physical pattern you'll actually hit these invisible rings of energy. So you can't actually plan this stuff. <laughs> you can't make this up. They are there because they are basically harmonics, invisible harmonics of the physical pattern itself. And it's all based on outgoing generated uh, regenerative geometry. And I know this looks like a complete mishmash uh, on a slide, so you'll have to take my word for it. In fact, if, you, if you're on the web, you can actually make this out a lot better. And if you can possibly wait, my book may be out within a year, which would be nice. But you can see how all this, uh, the, the uh, physical design generates itself in this hidden pattern, which again mimics the unalterable geometry of the heavens. 
Another way that this geometry manifests itself is in the physical design itself. This is a, uh, an extraordinary pattern uh, from 1999. It's a ninefold pattern which is actually predicted by a couple of people. Um, and it shows you how the geometry seems to relate itself to different elements of the design. At the top you have uh, the pentagram. You can see how the inner circle of the pentagram just touches that little thin ring. And that thin ring, by the way, is only about four inches wide. You can't even uh, squeeze a hedgehog through there without doing any damage. It's very, very thin indeed. And you can see how when you generate that pentagram outwards, that line, physical line of the crop circle, hits exactly where it is. And the same for here, for these little circles. You can see the relationship. And where you don't have anything, like this little ring here, you'll pick it up here. Here's a hexagram. And it hits the points where the pentagram didn't. And you can keep going. You could have sevenfold geometry, which is the most uh, excruciatingly difficult one to produce. You can see how it relates to the central circle there, how it relates to that little ring. And then the exit point hits the edge of the formation at the center there. It's very, very precise. Even when you actually project the pattern of the ninefold pattern of the physical formation itself, you'll find how these little rings here, the relationship of those, those two thin rings are perfectly governed by ninefold geometry. But wait, that's not all. <laughs> Here's a twelvefold geometry which gives you the relationship between these two rings here and the edge of the formation itself. And it goes on. At the bottom, if any of you uh, know about um, the, ph the phenomenon at all, um, again, back to Gerald Hawkins' theorems, here we have two of Gerald's theorems, theorems two and three, I believe. Um, theorem two deals with the relationship of an area uh, to another, which is governed by a square. That relationship is two to one. And if you're into music, that gives you the perfect octave, where you have a relationship of an area that go is governed by a perfect equilateral triangle. It's a three to one, that's a double octave. So we're talking music here. But it's incredible how much work you have to go to, to encode this information. It's, it's, it really is a lot of work. So the structure of atoms, plants, and the human body is a series of harmonic relationships and resonant frequencies relative to the music scale. And this is something that science has uh, discovered over the years with the uh, advances in uh, the electron microscope. So part of the reason why we recognize crop circles is because we're actually looking at a mirror image of our own self, our own atoms, because they are based on the same principles of sacred geometry, which is the same principles bound within the planets, is found in these particular formations. So this, uh, they're basically, we're talking about the same resonance structures found in nature. Here we have a formation which was, had actually appeared outside Harwell Nuclear Laboratory in England. I bet that gave him something. And here you have the pictogram version of it. And you can see the relationship. It almost looks like a, a, a mandala, a, a Buddhist mandala. And the relationship of that hexagon to the edge of that little ring gives you the same basic structure as, as things like the X-ray fractal pattern of beryl. Now, that's, again, it's a lot of uh, trouble to go to to incur this kind of information, but someone's trying to tell you that these are very, very basic patterns that are found in nature as well. So whatever's happening is using very basic principles, even though they might seem very alien to us at the time. Uh, may I mention that it's very rare to have the uh, tram line going right through the center? Yes, it is. Formation. Wouldn't you say? Yeah, usually hoaxers will you know, use that, but you've already checked the geometry and oh, yeah. it came out good. And yeah, that, that actual uh, design is actually taken from a direct overhead which only required about 4% of um, perspective correction, which is pretty good. Can't cheat on these things. Now, for some obscure reason, uh, hoaxes failed to have that kind of resonant effect on the human body. I don't know why. Um, this is a selection from the early days of hoaxing, and uh, it's... <laughs> which one, Mork? <laughs> <laughs> I actually missed one that had, uh, if I may say this in America, a penis, um, which actually is very anatomically correct um, during its most excited stage. Uh, I left that one out because it doesn't need any uh, uh, adding to. But um, it's pretty much acknowledged by uh, my colleagues, I'll say, 
that uh, the hoaxing really got going uh, after the phenomenon itself started getting attention around 1990, 1991, which ironically is a time when the army starts getting very much involved, but that's another lecture altogether. Um, and I won't go into it, they're very naughty people. And yes, I do have black helicopters flying over my house, I kid you not. And like I said, I didn't believe in any of this. I was in advertising, I was minding my own business, earning a lot of money, and I gave it up to get involved in this because something was there. Um, yes, there seemed to fail a harmonic resonance in the human body. But, having said that, and by the way, these are some of the early ones from like the early 1990s. Having said that, uh, there is a group of people who actually have started to make better and better formations over the years. And then again, you know, the hundredth monkey does come in, into play with this. I mean, you do this every year, every year, you're bound to get better at something. This is one of the more coherent patterns, and I've applied the same rules of sacred geometry as I have to the other patterns. And you can see that even though it's a pretty coherent pattern, that it just misses. I mean, you're talking a distance here of about six feet. It's quite a wide margin. And you can see here where the geometry just doesn't quite fit. It's just ever so slightly out. It's one of the better efforts, I must say. Even here, where this actual geometry should be, when you project the six-fold geometry, it just misses. But, you know, by quite a substantial margin. I mean, that's about, ooh, 15 feet. So you, the idea that you can actually encode uh, geometrical patterns in a field doesn't necessarily mean that you're cre recreating the same phenomenon, because what we're dealing here is a phenomenon where the plants are also undamaged. So it's not just about pretty patterns. This particular one was made by a group called uh, the Circle Makers, or Team Satan, just in case you come across them. And uh, you'll find lots more information on them on my website, because they keep lying about things. Do they have some kind of huge comb that they use to comb the wheat? These planks, about three feet wide, which is about the width of the trunk of a car. Handy, huh? <laughs> now, if it was America, you'd have six foot plank. <laughs> Although they have boats anymore, I don't know. Been a while since I've been here. Now, there are actually very strategic references to sound in crop circles. Um, this particular one uh, at Stockbridge, you have here a sevenfold uh, pattern, which is a heptagon, and your heptagon traditionally is associated with the music scale, it's the intervals of the octave. Not only that, and you can see the, how beautiful the, the geometry is. Here's the inner heptagon there, the seven points. And when you project it outwards, it hits exactly where it should be. And even those little points of the hexagon give you those little half moons right there. Very, very good precision. Not only that, but when you take this invisible line there as a relationship to the exterior of the formation, you have a square. There's a rock tape again. Not only that, but uh, the village next to um, where this happened happened to be the village uh, of where the um, leader, actually the um, late leader of the London Philharmonic Orchestra, Leopold Stokowski, used to live. So that's that connection with the subconscious again. And they're always giving these little messages. Curious little people. Here you have a much more blatant reference, uh, a sevenfold heptagon done in a fractal pattern or an idealized fraction, uh, fractal pattern and it's reversed on the inside. Very complicated, and the farmer was so impressed with it that he cut it out the next day. Thank you very much. <laughs> Luckily enough, I got there just in time. Um, what was interesting about this particular formation was the fact that uh, I heard some notes of music, uh, and I wasn't going mad, I don't do LSD, and uh, neither did my friends, and one of them's an accountant, and the other one's a um, reflexologist, and we all th three of us heard these notes of music. There were four notes of music, uh, one was an octave of the other, uh, almost like a do 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 and it just kept going. So we're looking around looking for an ice cream van, which in the middle of Wiltshire... <laughs> <laughs> it's like looking for a, you know, a, a, a bird in the middle of Nebraska, it's ridiculous. And you're looking around, there's nothing to be found, and you're thinking, oh god, we're going mad. And as it happens, uh, coincidentally, we had a tape recorder with us, and we taped it. We rushed over to Marlborough, the nearest town, went to a music store and uh, said, uh, have you got a piano? Yes. You want to buy one? No. Is it in tune, concert pitch? Yes. Excuse me. So we played back this tape, got the notes. We thought, great, we've got notes of music, actual notes of music. It's wonderful. What do we do with it? No idea. Anyway, went back to America. I was living in the States at the time, uh, in good old New Hampshire. And um, I was doing my uh, research, and uh, 
as it happens, or it has happened in my particular case, books start falling out of library shelves at me. And uh, this particular one was like the idiot's guide to constructing geometry. One of the idiot guides told me about the heptagram, which is the basic founding principle of this particular crop circle. Um, in the heptagram, you have all these lines, but there's only three line lengths which are used. Now, this is something called the web of Athena. It goes back to the Greeks. And uh, the theory is that when you take these lines and you superimpose them on a stringed instrument, you get these notes of music. Well, my guitar was sitting idly in the corner. I hadn't played it much over the summer for good reason. So I went over with my guitar, juxtaposed these line lengths onto my guitar, and would you believe it, we got the same notes we heard in the crop circle. Now that's quite strange, but also quite coincidental at the same time. But not so, because we now know that geometry actually creates energy. It, it is a, it's in itself a form of energy. Uh, and when you get bad geometry, you get things like sick building syndrome. So when you have angles, it creates energy. So it's not surprising that you have a sevenfold formation, which is related esoterically to the music scale, giving you notes of music. So there's these little hints that have been given to you over the years. Another formation that uh, came along and po uh, poked his head at me uh, was related to something called the Pythagorean Lambdoma. This is the work of uh, Barbara Hero up in Maine who's worked on the Pythagorean Lambdoma for about ooh, 25 years and she's got lots of grey hair to show for it. Um, because the Lambdoma is, it defines the relationships between musical harmonics and uh, mathematical ratios and Pythagoras himself went to Egypt to study in the Egyptian mystery school. So you can start seeing where this information goes back to. Uh, it's much, much more ancient than we believe. Anyway, when you transpose the Lambdoma to a circular matrix or a spiral matrix, as you have here, you can see the entire scale of music. And you can see in here this ratcheted spiral. That's your, those are your, your octave intervals. It's almost like you've taken this crop circle and you've extracted the entire thing out of it. And just to add to the fact, you've got the eight little grape shot around the edge, which gives you a symbolic eight, which is your completion of the octave. So there's a little hint going on. Another one, very, very simple. This one, this is after it's actually been harvested. Uh, this one particularly, uh, was particularly interesting because it gives you another Pythagorean ratio, uh, including, uh, which is the three, four, five triangle and it combines it with a golden mean to produce the formula for music ratios. Very, very simple formation. And this was about the time I actually started asking, what is the connection with music? And it's almost, as, as, long, as, as soon as you ask um, these questions, things start popping up in the fields. This happens not just to me, to everyone. It, there's a subconscious thing going on. Just to add to that, here's that Sugar Hill formation. This is the, that, these are the dowsing rings extending outwards by about ooh, a thousand feet outside the formation. It was a gigantic pattern. It was over uh, 500 feet wide. But um, in this case, I measured all the, uh, the rings of energy that were going around the physical formation and found that the relationship of this wall, you suddenly, you suddenly come up with rings which are about half an inch wide in this much space. There's about 30 rings in this much space here. Can't actually draw them on, on here. But the relationship of this wall of energy to the physical design itself is again a double octave. So again, even in, without the physical pattern, you have this relationship to music. Then something very, very weird happened. Um, usually crop circles are built, designed, uh, so that the plants are laid about an inch above the soil. Uh, they're just bent just above the, uh, the first node of the plant and they hover above the ground. On this particular occasion, the plants were bent six inches from the top. Now, whenever this happens, um, I tend to pay a lot of attention because it says, look at me, this is very, very important. Um, so I, as, uh, as it happens, this book falls out of a shelf at the library and it's um, a book on cymatics, uh, print primarily the work of Hans Jenny, a Swiss scientist in the 60s. And um, sure enough, here's a pattern that talks about cymatics. And cymatics is basically the measurement of sound frequencies as they penetrate liquid mediums. And when you do that, you get these very, very bizarre patterns. Low frequency, when you send low frequency through, uh, say, water, you get circles, concentric rings, just like you saw towards the beginning of the lecture. And when you poke high frequency through it, you get very, very complex patterns. One of the greatest things that Hans Jenny did was also to photograph these patterns. This is water 
when you have sound going through it. There's the unmistakable pentagram. There's your sacred geometry. It's water being very fine, the very basis of, of matter itself. But the other more interesting thing I found... That's like a drop of water, right? Yes, it is. It's being excited. It's actually shot with a strobe. That's how you can capture it that well. It's an incredible book. It's actually out of print. But the other interesting thing was that suddenly he's coming up with stuff that looks like this, which, of course, we're getting in the fields in 1991. This is a, one of the most incredible hermetic designs of all time, by the way, uh, which I haven't got time to go into. Uh, it basically deals with the creation of matter itself. But you can see the relationship of the design as it's done in the laboratory with measured sound frequency. Quite a connection. Oh yes, very, very. It's uh, a Kabbalistic diagram. Uh, in fact, you'll find it in uh, oh, let's see, um, um, manuscripts going back to the 16th century and before, and uh, they date back to the Egyptian mystery schools. And that's another lecture in itself. What is this is the famous uh, Koch fractal snowflake at Silbury Hill, which also appeared in the middle of the day. And a group of German tourists were actually on top of the hill at 2 o'clock in the afternoon. And uh, I think it was about an hour later, the next uh, group of uh, trespassers walked on top of the hill. And, um, <laughs> I mean, it only belongs to the people. It's only fenced off. And um, it's about uh, 200 feet up. You get a very good vantage point from the top of this hill. And this thing just happened to pop up next to it within a two-hour period. Extraordinary. But here you have the pattern again. You can see the relationship, the hexagon shape in the center there. And then as it starts manifesting outwards, like a mandala, almost like the flower of life, if any of you are familiar with uh, Melchizedek's work. But this brings me to something much more left brain here. Because my colleague Paul Weigay has been working on detecting um, sound frequencies, or just let's just call them frequencies, because since we're talking about either microwave or sound frequency, everything is basically measured as a frequency. Uh, Paul goes into crop circles and has been doing so for the uh, best part of a decade and takes his little gizmo which is actually manufactured himself and he finds that there are frequencies inside the formations which differ from frequencies outside. The curious thing is that he seems to be picking up frequencies in the 260 to 320 megahertz range. This is fairly consistent, not all of them, uh, but quite a, a, a generous number of them. And this frequency is also rising uh, to the point where a few years ago we were getting frequencies up to 650 megahertz, um, which starts to tie in with uh, psychics who have been saying for the last couple of decades that the base frequency of the Earth itself has been rising. So we're now starting to verify that. And NASA itself has also verified that the pulse of the Earth is going up as well. So something is manifesting itself on Earth. Something is rising. The curious thing uh, about this is that um, the frequency that Paul keeps getting in his crop circles is the only frequency in the entire human body that is missing. Now, uh, biologists know that the uh, DNA structure uh, is coded for a certain amount of uh, uh, proteins, but there are certain gaps in it. Now, uh, I don't think God makes things without a good reason. He doesn't do things superfluously. And we've always wondered, in, uh, in, in fact, uh, Greg Braden is a, a guy who's done a lot of research on this. Um, he's discovered bits which are missing in the actual code of uh, the human gene, which seem to be uh, prone to be coded in a future time. And when you go back to things like the emerald tablets of uh, Toph, as some people call them, although Tahote is a much more correct pronunciation, he also mentions that there was a certain point in time where humans will be changing to a form not of this, uh, of, the, of this dimension. And again, a lot of psychics are saying the same thing about this particular time in, uh, period in time, that things are changing. We are changing. So Paul is now finding that there are certain frequencies in crop circles which seem to be stimulating the human body uh, that no other place can do. Oddly enough, uh, there's someone else who's also done the same uh, studies in um, church grounds and found the same frequencies that are also evident in church grounds, which of course, as we know, are built over sacred sites. Now, having said all this, I'm going to go back to the fundamentals here. Since we're discussing uh, formations and geometry and uh, we're all very overwhelmed with this stuff, but let's talk about the basic principle, because we're dealing with, with bent plants. 
Now, what causes plants to bend? Well, laboratory experiments uh, in the 60s uh, with, with plants, in fact, uh, by Dorothy Ritalak, uh, her kids went off to school. She got bored. She didn't want to be a housewife. She decided to take a degree in music, and she wanted to see how music affected plants. So she puts plants in the laboratory, and um, she starts putting some on their own. Some are given some Led Zeppelin. Some are given some classical music. I love Led Zeppelin. I can't hear very well, but that's fine. <laughs> After all the experiments are done with, oh, and she also played Indian devotional song, in particular the music of Ravi Shankar, with that lovely sitar material, uh, which I can't sit for more than 10 minutes through, <laughs> personally. But she found, all kidding aside, she found that uh, when she exposed the plants to nothing, they just grew. When she exposed them to uh, heavy metal, the plants actually leaned away from the speakers and died. <laughs> when she exposed them to classical music, they leaned towards the speakers. But when she found that the ones that were played to Ravi Shankar's music not only leaned to the speakers, they also bent at the bass to a degree greater than 60 degrees. Now this is the closest any human being has come to bending plants with any degree of success. Certainly much more successful than hoaxes. Curiouser and curiouser. Now, if you start looking at Indian devotional song, um, it, it's a very, very curious thing. There's certain frequencies in this in Indian devotional song because when you actually play it to plants, it does strange things to plants apart from bend them. It actually alters the, uh, it alters the number of stomata in plants. It thickens the epidermal walls and makes palisade cells longer and broader. It actually starts getting down to playing with plants at a uh, microscopic level. Now, why should this be? Well, Indian devotional song uh, is uh, derivative from Sanskrit. And like Sanskrit and Hebrew and High Javanese, um, these are all utterances of the initial words of God. And uh, you try to change any of, the, of uh, Indian devotional song, any of the notes, or in fact any uh, notes or phrases of Sanskrit or Hebrew, you'll probably have your hands cut and your, and your tongue ripped out of your mouth because it is so sacred. These are the impressions made by the utterance of God itself. And Stan Tennant has done a lot of work on this if you want to go and check his work out. In fact, he's actually managed to take uh, the tube torus that we saw earlier, put it into the tetrahedron, which is that crop formation that was uh, the triangular one that was related to the cymatic pattern. And he, by the combination of these two elemental patterns in sacred geometry, he managed to extract the entire Hebrew alphabet in its order. So we have, we're starting to figure out why it was that the ancients had so much sacredness for these things. They were, they were pretty much on track. So here, in this particular formation, now relating it to crop circles, this crop circle is uh, from a long, long time ago, back in 1987. It's shaded in gray, basic circle with a ring, with a little appendage. What happens here is that you can, uh, the relationships mean, uh, of the dimensions between this circle and its outer perimeter ring means you can encode a hexagon into it. And from that, you can extract the drum of Shiva. That's where your Hindu music comes from which are also the, di the, di the, the diatonic music scale from where Dr. Hawkins has managed to get his crop circle theorems from. And this is just a simple crop circle. But is there a particular type of sound that's creating crop circles? Well, here we have a formation which is actually a hieroglyph. Uh, it's, um, it's the hieroglyph of a divine vibration. You can almost see it as the, m the pursed lips of the mouth. And from here you have rings, almost like there's energy coming out the side of your mouth. That's the hieroglyph for the, high, the divine phrase, what some people would, would term as om, which I'm not going to chant. Now these frequencies, uh, since they've already been discovered by my colleague Paul Vige as being in the megahertz frequency, we can then start figuring out that what we're dealing here with something called ultrasound. Now, the end, uh, there's some very interesting things about ultrasound. Uh, first of all, because the higher the frequency you use in ultrasound, the greater its ability be, to be directed. Now, this means that you can do some very, very creative things in some very complex shapes. And this range of frequencies also affects brainwave patterns. It matches the brainwave sequence in your head, and it starts giving you heightened states of awareness. So when people start saying, I've seen something in a crop circle, I've experienced a heightened sense of perception, they're probably correct because those frequencies in the megahertz range are allying with the brainwave frequency. 
On the other side of the coin, um, if you take a credit card into these formations, which are particularly high in uh, ultrasound and very high in the megahertz frequencies, as they have been in the last three years, you'll find that your credit cards, the magnetic strip on them has been wiped clean. So going to the mall is not a good idea after being in one of these things. <laughs> And uh, there's actually a very funny story, actually not for the guy involved, but um, he went into a formation, took some of the credit cards with him, uh, found that uh, when he got back into town to take some money out of the cash point, uh, he couldn't work any of them. But the ones that were actually uh, left in the car, and this was a baking hot day, it would have melted plastic, they were working fine. This is how we started finding out that it was interfering magnetically with things. The other thing that it does, of course, is that it starts polarizing liquid uh, crystal displays. So there's a certain frequency that also interacts with quartz. And this is something we're just beginning to find out at this moment in time. But ultrasound um, means that specific frequencies can be focused like a light beam. And I said earlier that some of these rings uh, are no th uh, thicker than a, a fist, uh, maybe eight inches at, uh, at the widest. So it's almost like you're using a beam of energy, like a laser beam. And that's one of the particular frequencies of ultrasound. But ultrasound also prevents damage to sensitive tissues, so therefore it's useful used in healing. Um, the Aborigines are very good at using this. Uh, it's something called a didgeridoo. And uh, there are stories where Aborigines will fall off a cliff, they'll break uh, a leg, freak, uh, a bone compound fracture in three places. And there's a story where they actually play the didgeridoo over this affected area, and within three days this guy is up and running. Um, We've now since found that these frequencies can actually uh, rejuvenate uh, bone and also t uh, muscle tissue. And this uh, cymatic therapy, actually as it's called, um, pioneered in England, is now in use throughout the world. And uh, not many people know about that, but it's very, very effective. And of course, ultrasound has actually been measured at stone circles at strategic times of the month. Uh, in fact, if you go to some of the more... Um, I won't say famous, but the much more strategic crops, um, stone circles in England, you'll actually find you'll get a charge off the stones. You'll actually also get a ringing in your ear uh, from these stones. Uh, there's a great big ultrasonic charge in, at these sites. And of course, as we know, these sacred sites are on the energy grid of the earth. Now, having said that, on the opposite side of the coin, uh, below, when you have ultrasound that goes below 18 kilohertz, we have something called infrasound, just to confuse the issue. Um, this brings up something very interesting because uh, a long, long time ago, my colleague Colin Andrews was uh, getting very frustrated because he couldn't find out what was actually causing crop circles. So he walks into a field and very frustratingly puts his hands up in the air and says, God, if only you could tell me how these things are made. And within seconds, uh, and Colin's a very down-to-earth guy, he's an engineer by trade, he gets this incredibly piercing trilling noise which has since been captured on tape, not just by him, but also by the BBC, uh, shortly before it rendered one of their $48,000 video cameras obsolete. They've never figured out why either. That'll teach them. Um, but this noise was eventually given over to NASA and also to the University of Sussex in England, and they found that it had a harmonic component of 5.2 kilohertz, which is well within the range of, of infrasound. Now, this is interesting because other experiments that were done in Canada uh, using um, ultrasound and infrasound on plant growth, and also by the Russians, show that uh, when you use these things on plants, you get accelerated growth, and you also get bends in plants. Now, the frequency that they used was 5.0 kilohertz, which is basically that much away from 5.2, it's minuscule. So what, they, what Colin got back was an idea of what was going on with the formative process. But more interestingly is that when you use uh, infrasound on plants, it disrupts the plant's chromosomes. And as you can see here from this example, this is exactly what it's done. Here you have a control sample taken from elsewhere in the field of a normal wheat sample. And you can see the chromosomes, how, they, how they're arranged under the microscope. Here, you see how they've been completely distorted inside the crop circle. It's quite dramatic. And I think another uh, nuclear biologist in um, Illinois also found that the uh, DNA structure of plants from crop circles is also sufficiently degraded. So whatever uh, the type of sound that we're using here, it's also affecting the plants themselves at a microscopic level. 
the other thing about um, ultra, uh, sorry, infrasound is that long exposure uh, to infrasound also causes fatigue and nausea. Unlike ultrasound, where you start getting brainwave patterns and you start feeling very high and lovely, um, at the other end of the scale, you will start getting sick. And again, um, this is something that's been reported uh, often enough to Lucy Pringle, myself, other researchers. A lot of people go into these formations, and particularly just after they've, they've been found, they'll go in, they'll find themselves uh, being very nauseous. Uh, there have been examples of uh, women who've experienced no less than four uh, menstrual cycles in one month. And I can tell you from speaking to gynecologists that that is physically impossible. Uh, one of them actually told me a story that, that this had actually happened to her, um, I think within a few weeks of going into a crop circle, and she was told that uh, the reason why she was having four menstrual cycles in one month is because of stress. Now, this woman works in advertising, and you can't get much more stressful than that. Um, so again, it's affecting the human body, but it's not exactly detrimental in a long-term run. No one's ever died of anything. It just seems that the frequency that's being used, or at an underlying level, has a resonant frequency on the body uh, in both scales, either on the brain or in the body itself, but it's very short-lasting. Uh, so my advice to anyone is if you start getting a little bit nausea or anything, just leave because obviously you need the energy to dissipate before you can go in. And yes, I've had it done to me, to me as well. Now, let's go back to ultrasound, sorry, the infrasound. Now, infrasound also produces permanent changes in receiving substances, as we have seen microscopically. And uh, the acoustic power of uh, infrasound is in kilowatts, which means that uh, when you combine it with water, which is present inside plants, it boils it. And when you boil water, of course, you get vapor. And when you get vapor, you have uh, cavities, you know, like a little cave, and the water tries to get out of the plant as quickly as possible. Now, what it does, it goes for the um, uh, one part of the plant, um, where it has any chance of escaping. And uh, here are some examples of something called blown nodes. The nodes are these little knuckles of the plant. And you can see there are these holes, as if a little alien has suddenly decided to go out of the plant itself. That's where your water basically has escaped. And you'll find this happens quite a lot in uh, genuine crop circles, particularly with high frequency, I find. This is the work of um, uh, BLT research team in Massachusetts. They've been conducting all kinds of tests into crop circles and found that um, all kinds of weird things keep happening to plants inside them. Now, having said all this about cavities in plants and uh, infrasound, uh, infrasound is a very, very rapid process. In fact, it's over it in uh, less than half a second. And we have had over 80 eyewitnesses around the world of crop circles manifesting in less than 15 seconds. Now, this is not just from eyewitnesses in England. This is from people as far away as Vancouver, where they had not heard of crop circles ever. And in fact, this information about eyewitnesses only came out 10 years after the reports had been collected. So there wasn't any chance to corroborate any of this. Having said that, one time when the British military decided to um, hoax a crop circle in front of the world's media uh, in the dark um, and also to try and take out a lot of the researchers in the process, um, what happened was that uh, Nippon TV from Japan decided to uh, stay at this um, experiment for a further week to see if anything else would happen. Now they had this whole field uh, um, basically maintained by a uh, high-speed camera, infrared equipment, uh, and uh, during the middle of the night one day, they actually caught a swirl motion right at the edge of vision of the equipment as if the agency that's trying to make the crop circles knows about the actual equipment itself. And you can see it. In fact, the film got confiscated by the BBC. Uh, but uh, Nippon TV actually made another copy of it. And it's, I think it can still be seen in uh, a video called Crop Circle Apocalypse or Crop Circle Communique, yes. Um, and it's a swirled motion that lasts about 15 seconds and it's just seen right on the edge of the video equipment. But a crop circle manifesting has now been caught on television. And one day we'll be allowed to show it. The other thing that happens with these kinds of uh, frequencies, in particular again infrasound, is that it increases temperatures of up to 100,000 degrees in under one second. Now, in the laboratory, when you expose uh, corn um, to this kind of frequency, the leaves Sorry, the, uh, it leaves burned stems. It also increases the soil heat content. Now, this is something, again, that we find in crop circles. And here's a perfect example of a, a stalk from a formation which has been bent, uh, sorry, has been burnt at the base, just charred. Thank you. By the way, we, we call that wheat. 
I know it's very confusing. They call it corn over there. I don't know how I'm going to deal with this in the book. <laughs> you call it crop rape? <laughs> Actually, I prefer canola. It's much more poetic. We call it oil seed rape. It's a very aggressive country. But anyway, back on track. You can see here where the charring has actually occurred. It's, it's very superficial. On this particular example, though, the heat was so extraordinary that it's actually cracked the inside of the plant. And this hasn't actually been crushed by people. Uh, I was very careful to take this from the side of the formation because you've got to be wary that people have actually been in it before you. You can never assume that you're the first to go in. You have to keep these things in mind. And in this particular formation, which is from uh, actually from this year, and uh, there was actually a UFO incident before it. Um, there was a, a couple who had been parking nearby overnight on a camper, and they actually saw uh, a physical craft hovering over the field, uh, just releasing a beam of energy, and then uh, the, it just disappeared. And next thing you know, crop circle was there. And in fact, it's one of the few formations I've been into, which is not only coherent, but the crop inside it is actually all over the place, flattened beyond belief, flatter than a pancake. But it's, well, everything is also burnt and cracked to the point where there are even cracks along the soil. Mm -hmm. Yet outside the formation, the soil is perfectly wet and you can actually hold it together. But inside the formation, you can basically just blow it away like it was, uh, like it was dust. Not that it's the only uh, things flying around the British countryside. It's not, we're not just dealing with physical craft here. We also have uh, lots of sightings of balls of light which are not physical at all. They're just luminous spheres. And you can actually interact with them. Um, again, um, a friend of mine has been able to do this on a psychic level. She's brought them in. I've actually witnessed this with two other people. We've taken video of it. Uh, there's many, many examples of this. Uh, another a colleague of mine, Steve Alexander, even photographed sorry, videotaped one in broad daylight, a physical sphere flying across the field, meandering across the field, almost co collided with a tractor out plowing the field and then veers off and flies off at high speed. And in fact, the, uh, uh, the poor guy who was driving the tractor was uh, the laughing stock of his village for quite a while until we showed him the video. And then they all shut up and I think he's been, bu he's been bought free beer ever since. But it, it just shows you how hard it is to, uh, to work with these kinds of subjects until you actually get physical evidence. Now, again, we can go on about ultrasound and infrasound forever. The other thing about infrasound is that it atomizes water molecules, uh, which also creates mist. And uh, many have been the times when we've been out uh, night watching uh, in the fields of England, and it's very, very uh, wet, very damp. And uh, suddenly, about three in the morning, you get this lovely mist that just descends over this area you're watching. And when the mist uh, comes up at five in the morning, there's a lovely crop circle in the middle of it. Um, this is very consistent, again, with the effects of uh, infrasound because of the atomizing of water molecules. In this particular uh, story, you have this, uh, this series of, I think it's 13 little circles, like a long, long avenue of circles, and this lovely glyph here, which is actually a chakra point. I think it's the base chakra. Very beautiful. But uh, it happened one afternoon. There was a farmer that was out uh, harvesting his field right here. And he reports seeing something like a series of cannon shot rising into the air, just like columns of mist just rising up into the air. Again, consistent with the, um, the laboratory uh, technique where you use infrasound and you create these series of columns of mist. So it's nice to have these little sort of eyewitnesses. Now, the reason why I'm showing this was because uh, I can go on about ultrasound and infrasound forever, but I think I'm, I'm sort of making the point. Um, it also scares birds. Now this might seem like it's very trivial information and that's why, uh, for example, airports use ultrasound devices to keep birds away from runways. Now the uh, story here is that, um, <laughs> it's actually very funny, Arthur C. Clarke, the uh, writer of 2001, decided to make his own crop circle. He hired five people, um, took them five days in broad daylight to fix, uh, which sets the world record for the world's developing crop circle. It's quite extraordinary. Uh, in the end, the actual geometry was a bit cockeyed, which is quite funny. But it's nevertheless, it's a good effort. It's well put together. It's only about ooh, 80 feet across, not very big. But the main story, um, a farmer who allowed permission for this to be done had had visitors, uh, visits from the crop circle in the past, and he was sort of sitting on the fence, wasn't sure which way to go, but he's one of these farmers that's just very intuitive. He'll look at things, and um, he'll keep an eye on, on stuff. He does a bit of dowsing. And uh, he noticed how when they finished this formation, the birds went in. 
immediately. The corn was easy to get at, and that's what made him a believer immediately, because he said, well, on previous occasions, when I've had crop circles on my land, the birds just don't go anywhere near them, even though the crop is right there, ready to be eaten. In fact, when the birds fly over the area space of a crop circle, they break formation and they go right around it. Not the first time this has actually happened. Very, very weird. And does it depend on if it's a fresh formation or not? Doesn't seem to. Uh, in fact, there's people who have even seen uh, columns of light actually coming down, and uh, they've even seen the, um, the trail of planes, the vapor trail of trains, actually break up over the formation itself, which is a little bit hard to figure out, but then again, you don't really see that very often, especially when you have like a straight trail and there's a hole missing in it. So these things seem to tend to stay there for quite a while. But uh, in terms of whether you can actually measure it, very, very hard. Although our friends in the military, I'm sure, have got some nice equipment, which I think they should uh, donate. <laughs> now, having said all this, um, so sound frequencies, sacred geometry and electromagnetic energy, uh, these are all shared uh, by crop circles, they're shared by ancient sites, and they're shared by places of worship. Now, we know that ancient sites uh, were temples we used for healing and for alteration of awareness. Now, the body and uh, the mind is also a collection of electromagnetic frequencies. Um, a lot of work has been done on this. I mean, the Chinese have been doing it for, for thousands of years. They just basically call it acupuncture. Uh, but recently, Becker and Selden have figured out that the body, the human body, is a series of uh, electromagnetic frequencies. They have polarities, and it can be uh, interfered with. So, not only can we receive information if we go into formations and sacred sites, but we can also give as uh, if we go to a, uh, a chamber and you chant, what you do is you're putting energy back into the earth because when you're singing, you're creating resonance. Just like you go into church and sing, you're also putting energy back into a grid. Now, this input of energy into the earth uh, can be done through toning, through meditation. So are crop circles affecting the earth's magnetic grid? Well, it seems that uh, it seems they're sharing the same magnetic structure as uh, the sacred sites. You'd think so. And more to that, the, when you get a crop circle, uh, and it happens to be next to a sacred site, and they inevitably are, there's one right there, there's a, a massive tumuli complex on top of that hill, and the line comes up through there. What happens is that when the energy goes down a, in a crop circle, it changes the structure of the pattern of energy at the sacred sites. And this is measurable. Um, you can go back a week later, the pattern's already been changed up here. If this used to be a series of uh, rings which have pentagons on it, when this pops up and it has hexagons in it, the energy structure in here would be hexagonal. So whatever is coming down is affecting the Earth's energy grid. It's inputting something into it. And we have lots of eyewitnesses who uh, claim to have seen tubes of light come down uh, and put in something into the ground, program something into the ground. Within 24 hours, 48 hours, you have a crop circle formation. Now, sometimes you have a structured craft associated with this, Sometimes you have a ball of light, sometimes you have nothing. It just seems to come out from space. It's almost as if uh, there are different types of agencies creating these formations. What is this formation? Hey, what's this one reference? What does it reference? What do you think? In terms of? I was told it was the elliptical path of eclipses, the last 18 eclipses. Yes, that's one interpretation of it. Would you repeat the question, please? Oh, uh, the, the gentleman was saying that uh, one of the interpretations of this particular pattern was the, uh, the path of the uh, elliptical path of the eclipses on the Earth plane over the last 18 years. And that's just one of the, the, uh, the interpretations so far. We haven't yet figured out anything else. In fact, it took me three months just to draw the flattened edges on this uh, design here. We've still got mathematicians working on it. We just don't know what's in here. Uh, but it's beyond my... Uh, computer ability to draw this and certainly has been for most people. We can only get an approximate dimension of what this is. So anybody else can feel free to add to this information, please. I would say the, the eternity, uh, going at eternity, I get the thing, uh, the, the eternity, the atmosphere, the universe, and, and then God, the circle, that's what I get out of it. And you're probably correct as well. That's the great thing about the formations is that there's so many levels of symbolism which is also why they create also so much controversy because one person will see this as the ellipses of the, uh, the, the solar cycle and another person will say absolute rubbish because they, just they come from a different background yet all the interpretations are exactly the same. I studied metaphysics and that's God in the middle, eternity. 
universe. Let me try. Let me try and uh, do, do the questions at the end because I'm going to run out of time. Otherwise, I'm trying to get to paradise. <laughs> anyway, the one thing I haven't quite mentioned yet um, is that um, the the other reason why we think that there's something being encoded into the ground is the fact that we've been playing with. Um, the vibrational rate of plants. Now, if any of you know about vibrational energy, and especially the, uh, the batch or bath flower remedies, the homeopathic remedies that are extracted from plants, um, we found that uh, by uh, dowsing, that the original flowers that, from which these tinctures were made are of lower frequency than the new ones, which seems to suggest that the plants themselves have been stimulated by this input of energy. Now, there's more information that's come since then um, which refers to the watershed. The one thing I haven't quite mentioned yet is the fact that crop circles, sacred sites and churches share something else in common and that is that all these sites um, are basically over bodies of water. This could be the watershed or an aquifer. And in Britain you have one of the world's deepest aquifers. It actually sits on about 400 feet of chalk. And uh, this creates all kinds of electromagnetic interferences in itself. But the primary thing that we is worth mentioning here, and by the way, this is an infrared photograph. Uh, the water in this photograph has actually been depleted from the ground. It's almost like 400,000 gallons just suddenly got taken into, into hyperspace, uh, got taken out. But the interesting thing is that the body itself is 80% water, as we know, and uh, sound affects molecules. And, um, and because these, uh, our molecules are made of sound frequencies, and because water is a great conductor of, uh, of sound and frequency, that something is obviously happening to the body of people that when they go into these formations. That's why you experience healings, that's why you experience all the states of awareness as well. But the more interesting thing is, is that water is known to have memory. Uh, Jack Benveniste was a recent uh, guy who actually developed this technique, even though the technique itself goes back hundreds of years. But he's actually found through laboratory analysis that it can be sustained, this theory is sustainable. If you throw energy into water, it will capture the energy. You can see it also. As, uh, as not just in, um, as, a, as a frequency in uh, megahertz or hertz, you can also measure the uh, water molecules that have been changed under the microscope and it'll show up as sacred geometry. We're back to this thing again. The interesting thing about uh, Benveniste's work is the fact that he was hounded by the French authorities and closed down, so we know he was onto something good. Um, but he's also been the guy who's uh, single-handedly taken samples from crop circles uh, where we have water bottles buried, and this is again the work of Lucy Pringle, and we found that in some cases the, um, the water has been charged 151% over normal. So there is an imprinting of water going on as well as the human body. Now, when you consider that the crop circles are sitting on one of the world's greatest underground aquifers, if you think about all this water that's coated that's going through the ground, into the aquifer that's seeping out into rivers, into oceans, into the water we drink. It's almost as if the phenomenon itself is generating its own homeopathic remedy. Now, so you not only are receiving the uh, change in awareness or consciousness visually, you're also drinking it, you're taking it in, which is why in the last, well, I'm speculating here, in the last 10 years, you see so much change going on in, in humanity. There's a lot of polarity, black and white. Uh, much more negativity, more things coming to the surface, more truths coming out. This is all part of a process which is accelerating, which of course the Maya talked about ooh, 5,000 years ago, um, and it's all to do with the last stages of the uh, development in the fourth race of humanity as we climb into the fifth race, which is supposed to take place around 2012, which is also another lecture in itself. So it's, all this seems to be uh, coming together in accordance with prophecy. So suddenly, not, not only has science also verified the fact that the ancients knew about uh, the atomic structure of the body because they related atoms to sacred geometry. We found that through uh, electron microscopes that that is so. The electron goes around the nucleus and uh, molecules and planets have certain geometric structures to them which are based on sound. So, again, science is elevating these supposed stone-wielding morons to the highest ranks of science. So it's all coming full circle again. All these predictions seem to be tying up, and the crop circles seem to be generating or accelerating at this particular juncture in time. So could crop circles be affecting a change in consciousness? Possibly, uh, at the homeopathic level, uh, certainly on a uh, psychic level. There's a lot of people who've been predicting these things even before they were happening in 1986. Um, my good friend Isabel Kingston uh, predicted this particular one, which unfortunately is upside down. Sorry. 
um, to within 24 hours, and even drew the exact diagram uh, as a reference point. So there's, a, there's certainly a subconscious connection going on if you choose to allow yourself to receive this information. One of the strongest uh, indications of the, that there's something, a change going on in consciousness actually is related to this particular design. Now you see the, uh, the little claws on the ends of these little circles. They look like frees. Now that's, uh, it's actually a very interesting little design. It's, it's, it's El Ayin. Uh, Ayin is the 16th letter of the Hebrew alphabet and its value is O, which is symbolic of the eye of Horus or the eye of God which is a reference to the pineal gland. Now your pineal is a uh, little thing between your eyes that uh, vibrates and it allows you to achieve heightened states of awareness. Hello. Now Horus again is associated with this in, in, uh, in ancient Egyptian mythology and Horus is the ultimate source of enlightenment. This trident is also evident in Greek um, alphabet. It's actually the letter Psi, P-S-I, from which we derive Psyche, brain waves, brain wave patterns again. Shiva is also associated with a, with a trident, and Shiva is known as the transformer. It transforms states and it destroys old ideas. Neptune is in astrology is also associated with a trident and um, which is also associated with a pineal and changes in consciousness. And in the horoscope, the effects of Neptune are mainly subliminal with their prime manifestations occurring through the psychic faculty. Now it's rather interesting that when this crop circle appeared in 1990, tens of thousands of people around the world suddenly woke up to the crop circle phenomenon. So if there is a change of consciousness, this formation alone did it and the symbols are right there. And in fact, if you take the word El Ayin, it's exactly the, uh, the phrase from where we now learn, uh, or at least we've extracted the, uh, the word that we love so well today, alien. <laughs> True story. <laughs> it's all in the Oxford English Dictionary. And uh, topping off our talk about ultrasound, well, we also know that ultrasound is known to affect the pineal, uh, which is the third eye. And uh, what happens is when you have frequencies in the high megahertz range, it affects your pineal because it starts vibrating it. It's like a little protuberance between the two hemispheres of the brain. And when you vibrate that little uh, pineal gland, what it does, it creates an electrical circuit to connect. It connects your left hemisphere and your right hemisphere of your brain. That's why you have these altered states of awareness. You'll find this in crop circles, you'll find this in sacred sites or a good local church. We're talking about exactly the same thing. So it's um, to cut a very long story short, and I've only shown a very, very small sliver of this phenomenon. Uh, it's a very, very long story. Um, so what I've basically said to you tonight is just a very short, thin part of the wedge. But what we are clearly leading down towards is that we are obviously dealing with a conscious intelligence which is operating with total control of natural laws and with complete respect for nature, because nothing of what you see here has ever been damaged. If you never walk into one of these crop circles, those plants will rise by themselves. They'll revert back to their normal state. It's quite magical. The phenomenon communicates uh, through beauty and intellect, which in turn arouses our curiosity. And it does so primarily in wheat or corn, which is the symbol of the fertile earth itself. So, if crop circles are harmonies from a creative universe, their message is harmony, reminding us that we are all part of one greater reality, that we are not egocentric, but cosmocentric, and that it's up to us to work in harmony to reverse our separation from Earth, that jewel that 19th century industrialists once called this exploitable, lifeless lump of rock. And certainly that is the one thing in this phenomenon that certainly can be done by people. Thank you.